welcome back when we came here we thought that at least you guys are aware about basic uh, hardware and uh, we just want to write something for the beagle board but we'll step back and uh, just we first know that what is a use case and uh, what is a general operating system concepts where this device drivers fits in into and then we can talk about that how to write device drivers ansul is going to tell you that how to write a basic device driver so now i'm not talking about this beagle board now i will just like you boot a normal linux box when you boot right and uh, then you can open a file you can read and write to a file right so basically what happens in the background so like is it too basic or it is okay to cover that it is okay okay so so here uh, it is general linux component wise what comes into when you read and write to a particular file so when you open a file there is a file system which gives you this facility that you can open read and write a particular file so you do any editor open a given file and you say that you want to write something and then you want to save the minute you save the there you issue a system system call that is called write so you issue a write system call write system calls takes your data into a buffer goes to the kernel it transfers data from the user land so you have allocated memory in the user land and kernel land has a different memory so you first you write your data into the user buffer transfer it to the kernel buffer file system takes that particular kernel buffer and give it to the block layer okay so so this is and block layer finally gives it to the like there will be transport so like think think about this that you attach a hard disk to a uh, system you attach a sd card to a system you can see it as a device right they have sda they have sdb something like that right so now this sda or sdb who gives you this there is interface so so this is the block layer block layer and the lower layer gives you the interface that this is the sda this is a hard disk sdb this is a usb device this is sdc this is, it can be a flash so so you so yeah coming back to right so finally file system transfer the data buffers from user land to the kernel land and it will give you give that particular buffer to the block layer that i want to write this particular data on this particular device now from file system perspective everything is a device sda sdb sdc it doesn't care that it is a usb device or it is a sata device right it all it knows that i want to write on dev sda on this particular offset starting from this particular offset this is the length of the data i want to write that's all that this is all it file system need to know block layer of the line, like this block layer understand that oh, this is the sda this request has come for the sda so there will be basically when your device driver boots up it says that i am the device driver for this particular device sda right similarly like if you plug in usb device so there will be another driver running in your kernel it will tell kernel that i am the driver of this particular device that is called sdb so block layer knows that oh this is the device driver of the sda it if you want to transfer data on the sda it will give that particular buffer to sda device driver the device driver of the sda <coughs> now this device driver will take that as a data and now it understand the lower layer that whether it is a usb device it is a sata device so let's take example of a sata device so 
So you, this device driver understand that this data buffer, I want to send it on this particular disk. So it translate this particular request into a SATA request, which your underlying H, underlying hard disk understand. It just understand SATA re request, right? SATA request, read and write request. It just understand that this hard particular hard disk, right? It doesn't understand anything about the file system or the way you are writing in the in a editor. So this device driver has responsibility to convert your read and write request into a SATA request and send it to the hard disk. And hard disk will save your data. Similar thing like you when you read. So in read. What you do is that you allocate some buffer into a memory in user land and tell that I want to read from this offset on disk, okay, on a particular files, files, okay. File system will convert that particular request to a device request saying that oh, this file is stored on this particular SDA on this offset, starting from offset X. So it will say that I want to read, file system will convert your read request to a, that I want to read from particular device SDA from offset X. Then it will give that particular request to the block layer. Now block layer will, is just a transport. It sees that a oh, request has come for SDA device and uh, there is a device driver already registered for SDA. So it will give that request to the SDA device driver. Now SDA device driver will again convert it into a SATA request, fetch the data from the hard disk and then give it to the block layer. Block layer will ultimately give it to the file system. File system will transfer data to the user land and then you see the data. So is that part clear? So so now you understand that why why we need the device driver, right? So this is a till block layer, everything is generic. It doesn't understand any anything about underlying device. Okay, you you can have USB device, you can have a SATA device, you can have a SCSI device, SAS device. You have heard about that SAS disk. So like normal SATA disk, similarly there comes a SAS disk. And then you have a flash like your NAND flash or your SD cards, this thing. So, so, so this device driver basically has the responsibility to understand, convert a request to a USB requ request or a SATA request. And so this works as an interface device driver. Okay, underlying device it need, it knows that underlying device how, what is the interface of the underlying device? If it is a USB device, it will convert a request into the USB request, send it to the device. When it comes back, any request response comes from the device. So this device driver understand that, oh, this is a USB response has come from the device. It converts into the more generic response and send it to the upper layer. So all hardware related stuff, has been coded into the device driver itself. No upper layer understand anything about hardware. Okay. So now we know that why why do we need the device drivers, right? So and now what kernel basically what kernel does? How the kernel basically understand that you boot your Linux image and you see that all the disk has been automatically identified, right? Or when kernel goes to your device driver. So that part I can cover.
so basically what i'm want now we know that how, how you, what is the device driver functionality is now we are uh, going to cover that basically that how the kernel understand and how the kernel interact with the device driver so first time when the kernel boots up when it passes the control to a device driver okay so let's assume that in a like in a hardware on a system you have seen that pci slots right that and you plug in any device that particular pci slot like you can plug in your disk and uh, you can pl plug in any pci device okay so so pci has a, a standard format so all device which is support saying that i am pci device it has to expose certain information on a device will have certain information on a given memory location okay so so if it is let's assume that this is the device memory so here at some memory location x and that is that is true for all the pci devices if anyone is claiming any device is claiming that it is a pci device it has to follow this protocol that it has to give this information that what is like pci id and what is vendor id and then device revision or something device information device info so so on a pci it says that so this is a pci device and on a given memory location x it will have information that this pci device is from vendor let's say call it lsi and this is the device id okay now what happens that kernel will have a generic pci layer which will just go, go and probe on this particular pci link and look at the each slot and sees that oh there is a device so it goes and read particular memory location from that device and then it sees that it doesn't kernel doesn't understand that what is this vendor id or what is this uh, device id so what it does is that it just broadcast that i found a particular device okay and is there any driver so in your driver what what you so 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 this this is called pci probe so when you register your driver you provide some interfaces to the kernel that if you find any new device call me on this particular call my this particular interface let's say that we call that particular interface as my pci probe okay so when kernel detected that there is a pci device connected to slot 1 so it will and it will send that request to all the drivers which has been registered with the kernel as a pci driver okay now any particular driver will look that oh this is the vendor some let's assume that lsi has given you a pci driver so please when it sees that oh this is the string vendor id is matching with the vendor id of my driver for which this driver is supposed to be so when it sees that then it's tell kernel that yes i am the driver for this and other drivers will reject that it will just they will not send any response so once so once kernel knows that oh for this so now on what kernel knows that this is the when for this particular device pci dev a there is a driver that this driver is the main handler for this particular device now any request comes like go back here so now if any request comes to the block layer which is a part of the kernel itself and now it knows that oh, for this particular pci device we have a registered device driver lsi driver and it will send that request to that particular driver so is that part clear so there can be other drivers as well like we have a i2c driver i2c devices uh, have you heard about i2c 
So this just a wire, right? So on wire also, so kernel this I two C devices also has to follow a certain protocol. Okay. So when the kernel boots up, it just sees that oh, on this particular I two C we have some device attached to this particular slot. Kernel doesn't understand that what this device is. So you are going to write a driver for this device, I two C device, right? And you register with yourself your driver with kernel saying that I am the driver for this particular I 2 C device. So whenever kernel a request comes to that particular device, kernel will automatically send that request to your driver. Ansel will uh, tell you about uh, how to write a driver and what all the components basically required in the driver, memory management, how you can do locking and those like basic stuff which is required for a general operating, general driver. So this is very much hardware specific so that those hardware specific details are contained in this device driver so that it does not get scattered in whole kernel. So from above you say, say you are watching a movie right, so your movie is stored in on this hard disk. Now so when you are watching a movie, this movie is being read from hard disks right. Now, so your uh, say Windows Media Player or VLC Player, whatever, it is starts reading this movie, but this movie resides here, hard disks. Now, I mean, so it say it issues the operation read. Okay. Now this read gets translated. It goes to the now you have say four disks, four drives, say drive D, E, F, C, D, E, F. Now movie resides in drive D. So I mean who has this information that this movie is this particular read request belongs to drive D not E. So that is the file system. File system knows okay this read request should go to the device D. Then it goes to the block layer as Devesh mentioned and transport and the device driver contains all those hardware specific details right. Because sometime you buy a hard disks from, uh, so you must have bought this external hard disks, right? So, I mean, vendor could be different, right? Sometime you buy it of Western Digital, sometime it is of Fujitsu or whatever. So, those details are understood by specific device driver only. So, I mean, have you seen this? I mean, you connect a device, right? And it says Windows says that unable to find the hardware driver, right? see this. So, because it does not have that driver which can understand this the language in which this hard disk can be talked to. Okay. So, that is why you require you put in the CD or specify the location okay, here is the device driver for this. Okay. So, these all these details I mean he has covered. Now, alongside he has written this memory manager. So, memory is another component of the OS right. So, when you want to perform certain operations you want to say okay, I want to send a command to now you are sending a read request to hardware hard disk sorry. So, you require certain memory right, you require some amount of memory which will in which you will write your command say sub, suppose the hard disk say the read opcode sorry I should, I should write bigger no? say the read opcode is hex 1. Okay. So, and after that you write offset, offset is the because hard disk is say 32 GB. So, from where I should read? So, offset is say I am writing it MB though it is in sectors 1 M and say length how much is to read? Length is say, uh, say read uh, 1 KB. Okay. Suppose the format now the 0 x 1 this value then 1 m is the offset and then 1 k. So, this kind of request will travel to hard disk. In the format, in the format hard, hard disks understands right. If suppose hard disk says okay, first thing should be the opcode whatever is defined by the hardware. So, now this request travels to the hard disk it understands okay, 0 x 1 is the read that is why it will read. Now, but all these things require memory right because you are going to write somewhere and that memory addresses will travel to the hardware. 
so that's why he's mentioned this memory component okay now what is a hardware driver so hardware driver is now you can understand it's translator between two talking entities not knowing the same language now these two talking entities are one is the kernel and other is the driver other is the sorry hardware so hardware driver sits between that now kernel wants to talk to hardware driver but it cannot directly talk because it doesn't understand the language of it so you require some translator some you know someone who can understand language of hardware hardware so that part is you know done by hardware driver so what does it do first of all it talks i mean it can communicate with the hardware and as well as it, it hides the complexity of accessing the hardware you can put the same code into kernel right every time for all i mean hardware existing in this world you can always put code in kernel but it will clutter everything so it hides the complexity of accessing the driver very common example is disk driver right so uh, your cpus you must have bought the ssds right you go and you say sata hard disks i want to purchase say 500 gb sata hard disks i want to purchase sata what is sata sata is the protocol by which this hard disk communicates okay so whenever you want to talk to hard disks you will send a sata command whenever it, it wants to send a response okay i have read it will send a sata response so this device driver it's again and when as we mentioned that it sits between os and hardware so this is what you know this is the hardware this is the kernel driver sits between communication is both ways kernel sends a request hardware driver translates it in the language which is understood by hardware sends it to the hardware again hardware completes the request sends the response back to driver driver translates translates in the you know language which kernel understands and sends the response back yeah so android you know we covered so it was so now in the whole idea is to write a driver for beagle board so now we are porting android on beagle board so that's why i mean this slide for completion you know sake of completion that so what is android we know this mobile phone software platform and uh, i mean as we have covered in last session that based on linux kernel it, it's mainly you know uh, rewritten or probably the bugs are fixed and this things are included into this the code which is included in this only to suit it to the mobile phone platforms so what all changes again we have described what all changes have gone into android from linux kernel to android you know for mobile it is a very specific hardware which for which you don't need a very huge uh, operating system right right because on a x86 box you have huge da data stores big disk you can store very big kernel over there you can have a very big root file system but on mobile think just you have a one sd card of some initial it was some mbs now it is available in gbs as well so on that and then you need to store your information as well like you want to store your music files on the same sd card so so that's why this android is basically cut down version the trim down version of the linux okay so and like as ansel said it can go back yeah this one yeah yeah so it's you know trim down version of linux which is changed to suit requirement for mobile application development or mobile driver developments you know now we know there are we should be aware of two things if you want to write a device driver first is the kernel and other is the hardware uh, now i'll cover so what is the resources which driver requires from kernel you know this for this interaction uh, first of all driver should be able to register itself with the kernel it should be able to tell it to the kernel that hey i am exist i i exist so that we call registration process so every kernel provides certain apis 
So, for I2C driver, if you go to the Android, you see I2C underscore add underscore driver, that is the API. If you call this API with the necessary parameters, so parameters will be your proof function and so and you call this API, so kernel will register your driver with uh, itself. Now, every time it will find a new device, it will send you also, oh, hey, I have got this new device, are you the owner of this? So, this is the part, you know, kernel should be aware of the presence of device driver. So, how do we do it? We register driver with the kernel. In this registration process, we provide probe and attach method. What are probe and attach method? Probe is a method by which if kernel reports some new device to you, you should be able to identify the I own this device or not. And then as we mentioned in last session that I mean could be a loadable module or a statically linked driver. So, loadable module is as you mentioned that I mean it is fast for or a statically linked I mean. So, you want to build your driver into kernel only every time I want to compile kernel. So, that is why we called stat statically linked driver. And yeah, now so for interaction, every driver requires certain. We say memory; it requires memory. So that is the resource of the kernel, and it requires you know locking. So locks, uh, and okay, I'll come again. What, what are locks? It requires memory. It, it will require locks, and it will require a notification. You know interrupts. What are interrupts, right? So, so it requires. Okay, if I get, a, if a interrupt is received, then driver provides a handler. Okay. I mean call my this handler. Okay. So, driver needs to tell kernel this is my interrupt handler okay. and it require memories as well as locking primitives. So, uh, um, I will also come in why, why do we require locks? Uh, what are locks? Locks are you know in general they are protecting mechanism right. You protect something, you lock it under something. So, in general uh, we lock uh, say we lock something inside our room, so that is protected, right? Same concept is extended here. So, but you know, not because of someone is going to steal something, but you know, you you know preemption also. What is preemption? You know, okay. So, kernels are preemptive by nature. What is preempt is you know, if suppose one process is running, right? If suppose you are writing a word document, if that process is does not yield the CPU. So, only that process will be running, everything else will stop, you know. So, to increase responsiveness, interactiveness, kernel provides this preemption. So, say after say every 5 milliseconds, it will preempt process which is running and it will bring a new process. So, that every process will get a fair chance, you know. This, this thing is called preemption. So, now, if you are in middle of something, you are writing a word document okay, and kernel preempts you right and then the new process which was you know basically uh, in the new process that tries to access the same thing or say, take the example of you are copying a movie, okay. you are copying a movie to hard disks and kernel preempts you in between. But and your another process is VLC media player, which is trying to access the same movie. If you are not protected, you know, it will things will get corrupted, right? Because I mean you are in middle of a process and uh, it is on a higher granularity actually. So you are you are in middle of a process and you are kicked out. Someone else comes and tries to access the same thing which you are in middle of modifying. So, to restrict again or to safeguard against these kind of preemptions, these kind of kicking out, kernel provides locks. So, what you do? So, if you want to protect something, you will take the lock do step 1, whatever is your steps, whatever you want to do, you do it and unlock. So, now it is guaranteed that I mean if you are holding a lock and you are kicked out from here, okay, nobody else can take the lock because lock is still held. 
if somebody else is trying to do now these locks are designed in such a way that only one guy can take it there are different type of lock but currently assume only one guy can take it okay so if you have taken a lock and you are at a step one you are kicked out the other guy who is trying to come he cannot take a lock he'll try to take the lock but he'll not be able to succeed and he'll be kicked out you again after some time you will again be restored your process will be restored you execute step 2 and unlock so we require locks to safeguard against this you know uh, preemption or the unplanned yielding of cpu i would say yeah you synchronization is the term actually which is used so synchronization of data accesses across multiple processes that is called uh, this thing you know that is again done by done, done using locks so now we clear on this uh, driver requires certain system resources memory locks and all interrupt handler it registers kernel is made aware of the presence of the device driver and kernel also need to know if i want to perform a certain task task how would i you know indicate it to a driver so for that driver provides a method or say in case of example if a disk driver disk driver will say okay if you want to read this is the method you should call that is the thing which is required so driver provides a method for request to perform a task if kernel wants to perform a task it will provide a method there are standard ways for this you know depending on the kernel android has a way so for a disk driver you provide a q uh, what do you call it q q command yeah so you provide a q command function for free bsd it could be different but concept is across the os it same then another interaction which is required which is uh, which happens between driver and the hardware for that you need to understand the hardware specification i mean how do you communicate with the hardware and the language in which hardware talks to we call it a protocol right so in case of sata devices the protocol is sata in case of i2c devices protocol is i2c okay so what is this interaction this driver and hardware interaction is driver converts kernel request into request which hardware understands now one kernel request may convert into many hardware requests so suppose now you have sent this kernel request kernel sends suppose a request of 1 mb kernel wants to read a 1 mb data from hard disk support the hardware uh, is ha our hard disk now the suppose hard this hard disk is not capable of returning 1 mb data at a time its capability is only say it can read only 1k data at a time so whose responsibility is this to split this request into uh, you know multiple requests that's the responsibility of the hardware driver so if it's it has sent a 1 mb data what it will do it will split into so maximum is 1k it will split into 1024 requests and send it to the hardware it will again get these 1024 response at a time and prepare the combined response and send it to the kernel so this you know basically you know splitting merging all these uh, these you know job all these uh, responsibilities rather are lying with the hardware driver could another example could be say our hard disk cannot handle say more than 20 request at a time but you i mean while i mean running your application to open a word document uh, open a text file watch a movie so you never really care i mean how many applications you are running so whose job is this again the hardware driver if hard disk cannot serve more than 20 disks at a time kernel sends say 25 request so this hardware driver will queue five request send only 20 then response of five will come back it will send another five so all these you know hardware limitations will be overcome by the hardware driver so now driver and hardware uh, so as i mentioned you know it mentioned it converts kernel request into request which hardware understands one kernel request may convert into many hardware requests as we have seen just now and to develop a hardware driver you require a hardware specification so if you want to access 
a hard disk. I mean, what is the language it understands? So that is again defined by the hardware vendor. So for BeagleBoard, as it's as I mentioned, it's open source hardware. So you get the these specifications online. Okay, if you want to access these NAND flash, in what register you should write? So all these specifications you require in if you wish to develop a hardware driver. And then interaction with hardware depends on the type of hardware. Yeah, it's very much true. Hard disk need not be accessed in the same way USB devices are accessed. They need not be accessed in the same way in which you access your serial console. So every hardware accesses accesses are depend on the type of the hardware. Now again, I mean, how do you write a driver? So first of all, I mean, you, I, mean, I think I mean you should be able to, you know. Understand this not now. What all do we require? We require a hardware specification. We require a register specification. Register specification. I mean, in what register you should write in order to get a certain operation performed. So that is again given by the hardware vendors. Then protocol to communicate with hardware. Uh, what is this protocol? I mean, the language which hardware understands. So if you are writing a protocol for SATA device, you should understand. How SATA protocol works. If you are writing a protocol for SPI flash, you should understand how this, you know, SPI flash works. And then again, how does last is kernel expects it to be informed. So when a certain request completes, how does kernel expects that if a disk has read something, how it will be notified? How the kernel will be notified that this read request has been completed? This is specific to the kernel. So now this sequence is now how do we write a driver? Yeah, be careful about the sequence in which we write. So as I mentioned, first we register our driver with the kernel, then we do the initialization. Initialization is in order to get ready, hardware has to you know it has to allocate certain resources, it has to be prepared before it can accept request, right? So that preparedness is called initialization right and then when your hardware initialization is done it's prepared to request uh, prepared uh, for receiving requests it will notify kernel hey i am ready okay so this registration so for example i mean uh, so for i2c device it's i2c add driver initialization is very much hardware specific say for uh, disk device you would uh, allocate the memory, certain memory which you will require to send to the disk. You will, you know, initialize your disks, whatever disks you have. Say you want to power up those disks which are which you own. So all those initialization will do, and finally, as a notify process, you will enable your interrupts. So when we say enable interrupts, means now if kernel sends any requests, hardware is, I mean driver is ready to send it to the hardware and ready to receive the response okay so clear steps and the sequence is important i mean you cannot first notify to the kernel hey i am ready to receive the request and you are not prepared right it cannot happen because you have to be prepared first only then you can notify kernel i am ready so step is register initialization and notify i am ready then these are I mean, how do you do these steps? These are very much kernel specific. I mean, just say for any component you want to write a device, just search for it. So APIs might be different depending on the driver you are trying to write, but steps will be the same. Okay. Few things you have to keep in mind while writing a driver. Uh, so first of all, this thing is you know very critical. Generally, people you know. Uh, it, it can cause issues which are very hard to detect. Memory coherency. So, what is memory coherency? You know about CPU hardware caches, right? CPU has hardware caches L1, L2, right? So, these are caches for memory, main memory, right? Aware? Uh, so, CPU has hardware caches L1, L2. And this, this is the cache for main memory. Now, if you are suppose you are sending a request to hardware and that memory location is cached into CPU cache. 
so if that memory location is cached into cpu cache and you are sending that memory location to uh, you know hardware and but since that memory is not updated because data is in l1 cache or l2 cache whatever so hardware will get the incorrect data so before sending uh, this request to the hardware you should make sure there is nothing in the cache so there are two ways either you flush the memory flush the cache sorry cpu cache or you allocate the non cacheable memory so non cacheable is the type of memory that will not be cached so os provides a mechanism mechanism say for i mean this uh, android if you go and you will allocate a memory dm alloc dma coherent so that means that memory is that will not be cached okay so this thing you have to be careful yeah but if your system does not have cache hardware cache you need not worry about this issue so you, if you don't have memory management unit available okay then other issue is synchronization as i mentioned you don't protect against something so you know one thing is you are submitting a request but if interrupt comes so suppose you have two request first request you have submitted and second request you are in process of submitting but since you are in process of submitting the first request gets completed now you will get a interrupt for uh, the request which just got completed and interrupts are always high priority in system so whatever is running that will be stopped and interrupt will come right so if you are not and you know safeguarding appropriately you might compromise with the correctness how come say suppose in interrupt you are accessing a data structure you are accessing certain variable which is also being accessed in the submission path so well explain so assume there are so suppose this is a disk this is request 2 which is your submitting and request 1 which just got completed so the case was you first submitted request 1 and now at this point you are just submitting request 2 and this request get complete completed in interrupt context what do i mean by interrupt context interrupt context means uh, system notifies you by raising an interrupt that a request has completed now this interrupt context is always higher priority than these normal contexts so whatever request you were submitting this thing will be will get preempted this submission path and interrupt will raise now if you are accessing a variable say where x in this path and same variable you are accessing in interrupt path also so you if you just you know finished writing x equal to say 2 and in request path in response path this path you basically change it to 3 now after this interrupt i mean if this response is sent you will see that x will be modified you know these kind of uh, you know simultaneous accesses these time type of common accesses you should safeguard against so be careful about these things so it is not really possible to list down all cases because as and when you are going to write drivers you will see but just keep in mind whatever you know uh, accesses are you know susceptible to these these type of synchronization issues you sh should you know carefully protect them yeah so i mean kernel again provides multiple ways of lock multiple type of locks so one lock so you require you know threads right so there are threads in system if you want to protect against between two threads it will just provide a simple spin lock there are variants one is a spin lock another is a spin lock irq save so that spin lock irq save is it will provide you again it will safeguard you against interrupt if you have taken is spin lock irq save then system will not raise an interrupt even if it's pending 
So, that way you safeguard against interrupts. There is third type of variant which is called bottom half spin underscore lock underscore b h that is safeguarding against bottom half. So, what is bottom half probably I will, I will cover a little later, but just keep in mind there are these three variants simple spin lock, spin lock bottom half and spin lock IRQ say. Simple spin lock is required when you have two threads and you want to protect a variable or a data structure which is being accessed only from these two threads or only from third context. But if you want some to protect something from interrupt context, then you have spin lock IRQ save available. And if you want to protect something from bottom half, that that will cover little later. It will uh, you should take spin lock BH. But yeah, I mean if you take spin lock IRQ save always, it will always protect you against everything. But you know, taking this spin lock IRQ save is heavy. So, I mean we are just you do not really generally over protect because of performance reasons. So, if you replace your all locks by spin lock IRQ save you are very much safe, but problem is it will hurt your performance a lot because even even if because if you delay your interrupts in system unnecessarily then it will increase latency of your system. So, by that way your performance will be hurting a lot. So, you should know your code I mean and understand what needs to be protected, what it needs to be protected against also. So, if it needs to be protected against only a thread then probably just take a simple spin lock right. Yeah, and the last thing in interrupt context, context does not allow sleeping calls. So, when we say sleeping calls what do they mean? Sleeping calls is the call which sleeps you must have seen the sleep operation right S L double E P is it in Linux. So, it sleeps the thread again. So, same way there are certain calls which are sleeping. So, suppose you do malloc in user space right. So, it can sleep though you might not be knowing because system is you know multi threaded. So, you might not notice this behavior, but user space program malloc can sleep because if system does not have memory ok I will wake it up after some time when system has enough memory. So, those kind of calls are not allowed from interrupt context, because if you sleep in interrupt context that is the highest context who will wake you up right. So, that is one reason. So, these calls are not allowed from. So, this is one thing which you should be careful of. These are few tips you know when you start writing just keep in mind I mean these all issues can you know come up it will help you in debugging and uh, so if, I mean before and if you know that okay what all issues can uh, arise so it will I mean help you in debugging then again another major issue is performance so we I mean writing a driver is one part and but you know you can do it two ways it says optimized driver good driver or it is a pathetic driver pathetic in the sense. So, if you are trying to access a disk say we have two drivers one is very well written in the terms of performance it will it is it will be very responsive it is you know it has it reduces the latency of the in the system and another driver is though disk adds. So, the disk response time is say 1 millisecond, but your driver adds another 1 millisecond to it you know these kind of issues are very important and since you know I mean if you are in, in embedded system especially you know it is very important to understand this these performance issues otherwise you know you find I mean you will this driver is just a you know piece of you know just a uh, whatever bad code I would say because I have seen this I mean open source we I have seen these kind of drivers which are just even if you do not require to protect anything take IRQ locks IRQ lock from start and leave it at the end though you do not require it. So, I mean these are so there are few tips and these are all from experience I mean nothing. So, first thing is longer the interrupt context higher the latency for pending interrupts. So, if your interrupt context is longer you are unnecessary delaying your interrupts. So, you are not getting the response. So, it will increase your latency. 
then another thing is so as a remedy to this use deferred work technique so what is deferred work this linux android all these oss provide deferred work technique so it means do whatever is necessary in interrupt context what whatever is very much necessary in interrupt context and defer rest of the things so how do you defer so uh, there are certain apis available so we call it tasklets bottom halves all these are comes under deferred work technique so uh, in interrupt context say we have minimally we will do okay acknowledge the interrupt we have handled the interrupt and schedule a tasklet so just acknowledging and scheduling and come out of the interrupt context so when you come out of an interrupt context interrupt will be enabled so rest you know again few more interrupts can come and when system will have time it will execute the scheduled bottom half or scheduled tasklet in the in the uh, you know whenever it, it gets time or whenever it is free from interrupts then again don't overly protect as i just mentioned i mean just you know it is always safe to take lock everywhere it will protect you against everything but your performance will be i mean you know very bad you i mean just try to i mean when you are going to write this just try to take a irq save lock from the start to the end and see the impact it will have on the performance of the system then uh this don't overly protect means this i mean protect only the part which is necessary don't protect everything okay then last thing is static fields of a request should be initialized once i mean there are if you are sending a request to the hardware you know and a field which is always fixed you know read opcode if you all know that okay your requests are only going to be read and read opcode is one so keep it fixed i mean you don't need to change it every time so so only because embedded systems the more instructions you execute you know more penalty you are going to pay so better thing is if something which is fixed keep it you know initialize it once and whatever is changing just change it with the incoming request then few more thing is exploit underlying hardware i mean this thing is very very critical i mean generally people write the code is you generally write the code and don't really care about the hardware uh see what is underlying hardware but it really hurts performance a lot so if you are working on arm you should understand I mean, how arm works i mean there are certain things about arm okay so if we pass more than three arguments to a function the fourth so three arguments to a function are passed into the registers but the fourth argument is passed on the stack so that means the four for fourth argument a memory access is going to happen all those things about your hardware you should understand so better you understand your hardware uh, you will be in a better position to write a better hardware driver or better program these things you know really matters a lot because i myself i mean we myself i mean we ourselves have seen this these things you know a simple program i can give you an example a what was I, that was 1024 cross 1024 matrix multiplication program okay so we have allocated memory from the kernel in linux kernel and that was taking around 300 odd seconds okay then uh, same program we have run, run into free bsd we were allocating this mem uh these 1024 cross 1024 memory from linux kernel the first test case second test case we say ran same test case on free bsd okay so it took around 600 some seconds okay program is same everything is same processor is same but and then third thing we have written our own memory management in the sense that you know because uh because we were using arm 6 so there are certain you know uh strength to arm 6 which we try we try to exploit and it took around 140 seconds so even half of the linux so understand your hardware i mean so i mean you might not be understand everything today only but i mean have that goal in mind okay so i'll keep improving so that will that way you will be in a better position to you know write that software and at last i mean most importantly know your code i mean so you should be very clear i mean what you are doing because my guide used to say i mean i mean code are for humans not for machines generally we tend to think these are for machines and machines will understand them but 
when you you know are going to you know probably improve them that is for you to understand or probably someone else will understand so you should be very clear on what you are doing why you are doing i mean why you have taken this decision thank you